everyone has their own favourite classic comedy, whether it be Only Fools and Horses, Blackadder or Monty Python. Mine is Dad's Army, based on Home Guard in World War II. I've wanted to do this for a while now, so, no time like the present, here's what I've devised. On Parade, a look at each character and the supporting cast. My top 10 episodes, an analyst of both films, the lost episodes and a tour of Thetford. Dad's Army ran for 80 episodes from 1968 to 77 and included a stage and radio show. Now there's lots of information on the show's history, but what rarely gets covered is its production. So here's how they made it. With the German Blitzkrieg dominating Europe and the invasion of Britain seeming almost inevitable, the UK government decided to create a unit called the Local Defence Volunteers in May 1940 to defend Britain from invasion. Given basic weapons, some of which were homemade, they turned local facilities into headquarters for training, eventually being renamed the Home Guard in July. Dad's army is set in the fictional town of Warmington-on-Sea, on the south coast of Britain between Hastings and Dimchurch. It's a typical seaside town with an arcade and small pier. In the high street is Swallows Bank, a butcher's, a greengrocer's, funeral directors and the Marigold Tea Rooms. The church is dedicated to St Aldman and the town has its own gas and water supplies whilst the railway station is on the Marsh Link line between Hastings and Ashford. The idea of Dad's army was the brainchild of Jimmy Perry. He had served in the Home Guard at Watford and was inspired by Mr. Porter. Originally entitled The Fighting Tigers, he made trips to the Imperial War Museum in Lambeth for research. Landing apart in Beggar My Neighbour, he met the writer David Croft. Perry wanted to move into writing and presented his idea to Croft, who passed it to Michael Mills, the BBC's head of light entertainment. Mills liked the concept, but did make a few changes. Firstly, he renamed the show from the Fighting Tigers to Dad's Army. He also added a war veteran and a Scotsman for diversity. The theme tune was written by Perry and its music composed by Derek Taverner. Drawn up in three days, Mills suggested Vera Lynn, but Perry wanted Bud Flanagan and Chesney Allen. Only Flanagan performed the song, being recorded at the Riverside Studios in London. The show didn't get off to a good start. It was disliked by test audiences and the BBC's controller of programmes, who didn't think the archive film should be mixed with comedy. This is why, in the opening scene, the residents are looking back at the I'm Backing Britain dinner. A pilot episode was accepted on the 4th of October 1967, along with five other episodes. David Croft came in as co-writer with the first episode, The Man and the Hour, airing on the 31st of July 1968. The draft was based around the sergeant, with three actors being put forward. Jimmy Perry suggested Arthur Lowe, David Croft wanted John Pertwee, and Michael Mills wanted John LeMessurier. In the end, Arthur Lowe was cast as a middle-class captain and John LeMessurier as an ex-public school sergeant. The appointment of LeMessurier led to the casting of Clive Dunn as the Lance Corporal, who was a close friend. Clive Dunn was actually the writer's third choice. Their first choice was Jack Haig, and their second was David Jason, but he was thought to be too young. The other members of the platoon were John Laurie, booked by Mills and cast as a fisherman, but later changed to an undertaker, whilst Godfrey was written for Arnold Ridley. Jimmy Perry based Pike on himself and wanted to play Walker. However, following advice from David Croft, the part was given to James Beck. Alongside the main cast were a number of extras, appearing in smaller roles, including some big names. The first was Barbara Windsor as a cabaret entertainer in Shooting Pains. Fulton Mackay was cast as Captain Ramsay in We Know Our Onions following his appearance in Porridge, whilst cricketer Freddie Truman made a cameo in The Test. A young Wendy Richards appeared in four episodes as Shirley before going on to star in Are You Being Served and EastEnders. 
Michael Knowles, meanwhile, appeared in five episodes and the film as various characters. Usually an army captain, he later revised the role in his Ain't Half Hot Mum. One actor who only had a small part was Geoffrey Holland in Wake Up Warmington. However, he later became a leading role in other David Croft comedies, including Heidi High, You Rang the Lord and Oh Dr. Beeching. Throughout the show's production, there were seven costume designers and seven makeup artists. The uniforms, as in real life, were gradually introduced, starting with civilian clothes, followed by forage caps, then jackets, and finally a complete uniform by season two. These uniforms came from an army surplus shop in Vauxhall. Such was the attention to detail that Mannering only wears brown boots, whereas the others wear black. The cap badges are also worthy of note, belonging to the Royal West Kent Regiment. It's another real-life detail, as Home Guard units would be attached to their local regiments. A detail from Series 4 onwards is the use of badge CP1 on the upper sleeves. This was the result of an in-joke by costume designer Barbara Cronig, the CP standing for Croft and Perry. In true Dad's Army fashion, one costume blunder involved James Beck. He turned up in a tracksuit because a typing error led Spiv's suit being written as Sprint Runner. Luckily, co-director Harold Snowd was able to find a suit in Thetford. The set design was drawn up by Paul Joel and Alan Hunter, along with seven other designers. Using personal accounts, the BBC's reference library and accounts from the Imperial War Museum, the team divided the sets into studio scenes and locations with scale drawings and models. Some of the sets became a regular feature, Notably, Swallow's Bank, although this was changed in Season 8, Jones's Shop and the Church Hall. One of the trickiest to achieve was the Clock Tower in Time on My Hands, as it involved a large amount of mechanics. Another intriguing set is the Pump Room from Asleep in the Deep. This was done inside a water tank, holding only four foot of water, with the bed being lowered at various points, whilst Hodge's bath was manoeuvred by hand. The first two seasons were filmed at the White City Studio in London, the exceptions being Museum Peace and Command Decision. Locations were scouted by Harold Snowd, with the majority of the military shoots taking place at the Stanford Practical Training Area near Thetford in Norfolk. Thetford soon became the home of Dad's Army, with the cast staying at the Bell Hotel. There was good cooperation between the cast and the army, with their military consultant, Colonel Cleesby Thompson, receiving the filming schedule from a junior officer. Other filming locations included the Middleton Sand Pits near Kings Lynn for the Two and a Half Feathers, Weybourne for the Royal Train, and Brighton Racecourse for We Know Our Onions. As well as the set design, Paul Joel was also responsible for the props. Smaller props, such as pencils and banknotes, came from the BBC store, but the action props were the responsibility of floor manager Peter Fitton. Most of the cast had been in the army during the war, so they were used to the firearms, although John Laurie and Arnold Ridley did carry dummy rifles. The Smith gun from We Know Our Onions was also a dummy, made from a steel shaft, plywood and cardboard. Whilst the secret weapon, in round and round went the great big wheel, was pedalled and pushed. The bomb, from something nasty in the vault however, was real. It had been dropped on Petersham and buried for safety and rediscovered by Peter Day's son. Peter Day was the visual effects designer and came in after season 3, alongside 6 other designers. Together they used a number of effects to obtain the desired result. One technique they used was colour separation overlay. It works similar to a green screen, with the background images projected onto a blue cloth. In uninvited guests, the chimney was mounted on a tank with a membrane to protect the electrics. The smoke came from canisters and the flames from gold rain fireworks. One of the trickiest pieces to film were the vehicles due to their slow speed. 
To get round this, the film was passed through the cameras at slow speed to make them appear faster when played at normal speed. The vehicles themselves were accompanied by mechanics and drivers and hired by the props department. When repainting was required, like in the captain's car, water-based paints or dirt was used. As with all filming, changes are sometimes made. The Royal Train was planned to be shot at the Severn Valley, but changed to the North Norfolk. It was whilst on location, for all is safely gathered in, that a Leyland Cub FK fire engine was discovered, leading to the writing of Brain vs Brawn. The character with the most vehicles is Hodges, with three, two motorbikes and a van. The van was a Bedford K-Type, and the bikes were a Bruff Superior 1150 and a BSA M21. Other vehicles included a Lanchester 30 horsepower in the Honourable Man, a Vauxhall 1440 Princeton in the Desperate Drive of Corporal Jones, and an Austin 8 Military Tourer in the making of Private Pike. But the best known vehicle is Jones's van, a 1935 Ford BB. Found abandoned in South London, it was acquired by a supply company, restored, modified and painted by the scenery department. Following the success of the TV show, a radio version ran from 1974 to 76. With 67 programmes across three series, the show was adapted by Michael Knowles and Harold Snowd. One of the changes was the renaming of some episodes. The Lion Has Phones became Sorry Wrong Number. Manhunt was renamed The Great White Hunter and Everybody's Trucking became a jumbo-sized problem. Some of the cast were also changed. Pearl Hackney voiced Mrs Pike with Graham Stark and Larry Martin voicing Private Walker. In 1975, a stage show was written by Crofton Perry and produced by Roger Redfarn. Consisting of performances and musical numbers, the show was broken down into two acts with eight scenes in each. As in the radio show, some actors were changed. Jack Haig played Jones when Clive Dunn was unavailable. John Brandon played Walker with Hamish Rufford as Fraser. The first show opened at the Shaftesbury Theatre in London. It then went on tour in 1976, visiting, amongst other places, Newcastle, Bournemouth and Bath. The final episode, Never Too Old, aired on the 13th of November 1977, where Jones marries Mrs Fox and the platoon toasts the home guard. It's an interesting ending compared to other comedies on similar lines. LOLO went up to the liberation of the town, with its ain't half hot mum going right to the end of the war. In reality, neither happened to the home guard with the Allies progressing through France and the likelihood of an invasion seeming less and less, the Home Guard was stood down on the 3rd of December 1944. After Dad's army, some of the cast went into other roles. Arthur Lowe went on to star in Potter and the 1979 version of The Lady Vanishes. John LeMessurier, meanwhile, continued doing films and stage theatre, with TV appearances in Wurzel Gummidge, Brideshead Revisited and Heidi High. Clive Dunn went on to play another elderly character as Grandad from 1979 to 84. John Laurie starred in The Prisoner of Xena, his last film in 1979, and three episodes of Jack and Nori, with Arnold Ridley taking up retirement. Being the youngest, Ian Lavender had a much longer career in theatre and TV. Smaller roles included Yes Minister, Goodnight Sweetheart and Casualty, but became best known as Derek Harkinson in EastEnders from 2001 to 2005. In radio, he teamed up with Arthur Lowe, for it sticks out half a mile, when Mannering returns from Switzerland after the war and buys the pier, with John LeMessurier acting as bank manager. Following Arthur Lowe's death, this was changed to Hodges buying the pier, Wilson remaining as bank manager, and Pike now Hodge's assistant. Together, all three get involved in a series of events to restore the pier. Jimmy Perry and David Croft continue to write comedies together. 
taking inspiration from their time in India, It Ain't Half Hot Mum ran for 57 episodes across 8 seasons, from 1974 to 81. Another inspiration was their time at Butlins, leading to Heidi High with 58 episodes across 9 seasons. Their last comedy together was You Rang My Lord, with 26 episodes across 4 seasons from 1988 to 1993. Afterwards, Perry only wrote occasionally, but Croft formed another partnership with Jeremy Lloyd. Together, they wrote Are You Being Served from 1972 to 85 and LOLO from 1982 to 1992. Croft's last work was O oh Dr. Beeching with Richard Spendlove from 1995 to 97. From a difficult start to a TV icon, Dad's Army has developed a strong fan base. In 1990, the Dad's Army Appreciation Society was formed, followed by the real Dad's Army in 1993, with both performing cameos across the country. Near Thetford is Bressingham Steam and Gardens, home to the Dad's Army collection. The collection includes a number of vehicles and a recreation of Warmington on Seas High Street, plus the Church Hall. In Thetford itself is the Dad's Army Museum, opened in 2007 and run by volunteers. After filming, Jones's van was sold to the Patrick Motor Museum in Birmingham. Displayed at shows across the country, it was acquired by the museum in 2012, whilst the statue of Mannering was unveiled in Thetford in 2010. So that was my look at the production of Dad's Army and what happened afterwards. Hope you've all enjoyed the video and don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment and follow me on Facebook, link down below. Coming up next, we'll take a look at each individual character. Take care everyone and I'll join you on Parade.